with my senior project. This is the first lecture among a series of six. And as you some of you might already know, the first set of three is going to be focused on the theory of relativity and its implications. And the next set of three will be on quantum physics and quantum logic, quantum information, and things that, you know, there, there's sort of two things that are not really related, but in the end will, you know, connect them in some way. And for now, let's introduce my partners. My wonderful partners, uh, Mr. Eric. <laughs> I'm Eric Regis, the uh, senior in what we're called. What work? I'm Lydia Wicker, and I'm a senior in Wheelwright. Wheelwright! Right. <laughs> so, just to make sure, everybody has a piece of uh, paper for the problem set and the post <laughs> workshop <laughs> starting, right? No? Okay, it's like.
time and distance is kind of really centric to how we think of units. Um, they, they don't, time and distance are not kind of abstract. They're, they're usually derived from kind of like physical ideas. How fast light can think. Kind of how long does it take for the Earth to move around the sun or for us to kind of rotate on our axis. So that's kind of an important thing to remember when you're thinking about kind of how we think about units. And kind of the most fundamental kind of event or kind of um, thing in the universe is C, how fast light is moving. So we're often going to refer to that when I'm, when I'm using the binary. You'll see why it lights on like So using the speed of light, we can build our own clock that's more precise than just looking at the side of things. Um, so we can set up an experiment where we reflect light up and then down um, a known distance. And so that would produce, each time it hits this time would be a given measure of time that we this is what's called a light clock. Let's review Newton's three laws. Newton's first law, the objects stay at rest. You've probably seen them in those commercials. So, mm -hmm. Objects motion tend to stay in motion. You see when no force is present. Newton's second law, net force. This is important, net force. You can have certain forces acting on objects, but if the net force, is, if the net force equals zero, it won't go anywhere. For example, now you're acting, you're under the force of gravity and, and the chair under you. So you're not moving anywhere because net force is zero. But um, so, if net, so net force equals MA. And then Newton's third law, action reaction. When you impart a force on an object, it imparts an equal and opposite force on you. This, this all ties into Galileo's inertial, re, uh, inertial reference frame. A reference frame that obeys the first law, where um, Objects in, that there needs to be a force to change kind of an object's path is 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 an, is an inertial reference frame, where the first law is true. Okay, so we have a
So have you guys heard of Einstein's very famous thought experiment called chasing a light? So he imagined as he rides on some random train in Switzerland that he suddenly can travel at the speed of light. What would happen? What happened to the world around him? Is this even possible? Well, the answer is obviously no. Because before Einstein, for an entire century, people developed a very elaborate theory of electricity and magnetism, which is where um, relativity fundamentally came from. So how many of you have seen this set of equations before? You don't have to understand it at all. Okay, excellent. So you've seen this set of equations, and let me just explain briefly what the symbols mean. So E, all the E's in this equation mean electric fields. And electric fields basically characterize electric forces. So you know, like charges <coughs> will repulse from each other, and um, different charges will attract each other. And that's what um, electric fields basically do. They exert forces between, uh, on, uh, between objects that have charge. And magnetic fields, B, if you see all the B's in this equation, magnetic fields really, they're incurred when objects start to move. So if I have a moving charge through uh, this forum, and I have a stationary charge here, and actually, if I have a current here and a moving charge here, the moving charge will be repelled by, repelled or attract, depending on which direction. But there will be a force on this charge. But basically, you don't have to think about all the details of this theory. All you have to know is that they describe electromagnetic interactions, which are quintessential. Because everything in this room, how we can have light, we can have projector, all come from electromagnetism. But there's something strange <coughs> that happened in the middle of 19th century, so in the 1850s, 1860s. Two German physicists, Weber and uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name, <laughs> discovered a strange quantity during their inquiry of electricity and magnetism. So this strange quantity, you see that I denoted it by V. What, is, what does V mean usually in the physics class? Velocity. Velocity, right? So they randomly, so if you go back to the last slide, you can see that there are two strange symbols that you probably haven't seen before. One is the mu naught right here, and the epsilon naught right here. So these two things are constants that are, you know, these set of equations have to satisfy the experiments that we do that are relevant to electricity magnetism. And physicists discovered these constants by doing experiments. But they found that when they make this special combination of the constants, they find a certain velocity that are measured, that is measured to be 3.107 times 10 to the 8 meters per second at that time. So at 1850s, when experiments were not accurate, that accurate yet. But does this number remind you of something? The speed of light. The speed of light. In fact, the speed of light in today's accurate measurement is about 2.997 meters per second. Uh, no, not <laughs> times 10 to the 8 meters per second. <laughs> <laughs> so they're very, very similar. But at that time, the scientists did not know why. They did not know why this strange, mysterious quantity that they derived out of some random constants seemed to match the speed of light. To understand why this, um, you know, speed of light actually comes out of this, we have to look at Maxwell's electromagnetic equations again, but this time removing all the charges. Imagine in the previous equations, you can see in the first equation on the right-hand side, there is a joule, a symbol joule. That means charge density, so how much charge is present in space. Whereas the last term, where you have a J on the right-hand side, that denotes some kind of current, so charge moving. So if we take all the electric charges away from a region of space, and then we examine these equations again, so you'll get zero on the top, and then you'll get rid of the J. So now I have to ask you guys to do some easy exercise. First of all, count how many E's there are in this picture. Three. Three? Three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how many B's? Three. Three. Are they equal? Yes. yes. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think they're equal? Well, I tell you they're the same thing. Oh. 
or I tell you they're part of something bigger. That electricity and magnetism are not separate quantities or separate entities, properties, but rather they emerge out of something bigger, and that is the theory of relativity. So that's where everything came from. In fact, after deriving the, um, after laying out relativity, we'll see that if I start from Coulomb's law, we have learned all learned this, how much two charges you know attract or fall from each other. I can actually derive magnetism using relativity. People who have been to physics club have probably seen, some of you have seen this derivation before, but this is by no means obvious. But what this says is that the theory of Maxwell seems somewhat, seems to contain relativity in some way, or is contained by relativity. So this is the final realization. When Maxwell looked at his set of four equations, and he thought, okay, I have some E's and some B's. How about, and they affect each other, because they're on the right-hand side and left-hand side, so the change of one thing affects the other, the change of, so you can think about them as, um, okay, so he derived, actually, we'll not go into mathematical details here. He derived, based on these equations, that there is a wave solution. There is a wave solution such that the electric field propagates through space, and magnetic fields propagate in a perpendicular direction. And together, they travel at the speed of light. Or not the speed of light, but rather this quantity. So these two German scientists, Weber and Cole something, did not know <laughs> what this quantity means, but Maxwell interpreted for them that this is actually the speed of what he called the electromagnetic radiation. And he postulated that this is actually light. And this is an accepted theory. Today we believe that this is, you know, they satisfy a lot of experiments that we try to do. <coughs> so is it clear now that light comes from electricity and magnetism? Yes. That is somehow, you know, just by solving the uh, Maxwell's equations, you get a you get a wave solution. So after that, we're actually going to introduce you to the fundamental postulates of relativity. The first postulate is called no, it doesn't have that. The first postulate basically says that if I choose one neutral frame, say on our Earth, as I said, when I sit, when I stand still on Earth, this frame is inert. But if somebody moves with a constant velocity relative to me, then he is also in a neutral frame. In fact, any frame that moves with a constant velocity relative to me will be in a neutral frame. So these frames are the basis of all our conversations today. And the first postulate says that all if neutral frames are equivalent. In other words, the laws of physics are the same in all neutral frames. Is this obvious to you guys? Okay, so let's make it a little bit more obvious. Think about me standing still in this room, and I toss the ball upward, and then it falls down. What if I do this in a trend? Am I going to feel the same thing? The ball just tosses up and drops back to my hand. Yeah. So there's no difference. You cannot do an experiment, as I said earlier, if Darius was kidnapped in his early age and only knows, you know, the trains are moving, you always stay from the train. He wouldn't know. He wouldn't know if the Earth is moving, the train is moving. They're all the same. You cannot do any experiment to distinguish it. So if I do an experiment on the train, it's going to have the same outcome as if I do an experiment on the ground. Does that make sense? Outcome and experiments are, should be independent. So, now if we accept that the first postulate is true, and we also accept Maxwell's equations, the equation of electricity and magnetism, to also be true, then what is a strange consequence? The strange consequence is that the speed that we derived earlier, this speed at which electromagnetic waves, at which the postulated light travels, should be the same in all reference frames. Which means the speed of light, say a beam of light here, should be traveling with this speed relative to me. But if I start running toward the light, the light still travels with the speed relative. Is this, does this sound strange to you? Yes. Yeah. 
well, it is very strange. So we have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's think about um, a famous quote from John. We have eliminated all that is impossible. Whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. This is exactly not Einstein. This exactly Einstein did not do. <laughs> because there was really no way to formulate, you know, a theory based on just rejecting all the past hypotheses. What he did was. He says, let's accept that our Maxwell's equations are true in all reference frames. And let's go from there and see what we can do, derive some new properties, derive some new effects, and use experiments to test them. It is a bold conjecture. Many people did not come up with it. Some people came up with how you can interpret the you know, transformation between different reference frames as non-Newtonian. But nobody could actually interpret um, or could make the bold conjecture, uh, conjecture that the speed of light is actually the same in all because it's so counterintuitive. There you go again. But you know, from now on, we'll ignore this number and we'll just care about the, this quantity here, which we'll call c. C is the standard notation. So now, I want you guys to take a look at the sheet of paper that I gave not, not the survey, <coughs> the sheet of paper. And turn to the beginning, the first section, the important conceptual work. And look at questions one and three. Like, we cut out 15 minutes of it and make it on the speed of light. 
Yeah, it does. That's why it's not a It's a warm one. Yeah. So what is it so who's we? Don't we say that the travel pass is going like So is it one second? Traveling at a pretty high velocity. What do you think is going to happen? 
if we take George's idea and I write on one of the particles, it's not that it's actually possible because it still requires more energy than probably all the stars explode in the entire universe. But let's assume I can actually write on one of the particles. What do you think I'm going to observe? So for example, if I have, so if two particles move toward each other, in my frame, two particles move toward each other with speed v, very close to the speed of light. Now I ride with this particle, then this particle is going to approach me faster, but not at 2v, but at a number that's closer to the speed of light than v. That's very strange, right? But we'll see how you can actually derive that. But the key point to take away is that the closing speed is very different from the actual speed that we measure of a particular object traveling through the Gaussian numbers. So, but that doesn't actually explain the third question. Anybody has any idea of the third question? It's a very strange question. Can two galaxies travel, move away from each other faster than the speed of light? Yes. <laughs> yes, you're right. Awesome. <laughs> how, how is the separation between two galaxies different from, say, hmm? you know, local oh, be, in light moving right next to me? So, <clears throat> I was just thinking, maybe it won't go at the speed of light, but let's just say there's two galaxies, yeah. and they go away from each other, that, let's just say, over half of the speed of light, so like 0.5c, shall we say. So, each of them will go away from each other, 0.5c. So I guess from one inertial frame, it looks like it's going faster than the speed of light, or travels faster than the speed of light. Well, actually, from if you okay, if we assume nothing more than special relativity, in here that would be exactly the same as the particle colliding scenario with speed v, right? Right. He wouldn't actually see the other star moving away past the speed of light. That's the key problem that velocities don't simply add. So in a in a you know, in a classical physics framework, if I am running and I throw a ball at speed v relative to myself, the ball speed relative to a person observing it from the ground is going to be bigger than me. Right. right. In fact, it's going to be v plus the speed at which I run. But this is simply not true in relativity. Because if you have one half c, I, if I'm running at one half c, and I, speed a, uh, and I throw a particle at one half c, then the particle, if you simply use your law, it's going to be traveling at speed c relative to some observer. Okay, so and this cannot happen by the posture of the relative. Is he using the Pythagorean theorem or something? <laughs> <laughs> that is close. We're going to use the oh, Pythagorean awesome. theorem at some point. Yeah. That's why it's yeah. geometry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Intuition is strong. But the real, really, the, the key idea between two galaxies is that the speed of light is local. You can only see that things cannot exceed the speed of light when you look right next to you. When the speed of um, it really passes through you at uh, 3 times 10 to the 18th per second. But as we see later in the general relativity lectures, space-time itself, the distance measure between them, can expand at a faster than the speed of light, which does not met, um, actually change the local measurement. So in everyday life, you don't have to concern yourself with galaxy moving away from each other, but you will see that in general, this is not true. Okay. Oh, why did I put entanglement? <laughs> so now Eric and Maria is going to talk about causality in special relativity. And, you know, so start from here. Okay. So this is uh, pretty similar to what we saw at the beginning. So we have the present is the line here, where t is equal to zero. So it's right now. And then the future is any time of the is positive and the past is negative. And obviously, this is. But let's look at a space-time diagram um, using in special relativity. We construct um, two axes, x on the horizontal axis and ct on the vertical axis. Now, if you were to shoot, okay, well, another, another thing. On these space-time diagrams where you have these axes, also known as the Minkowski diagram, um, an object's path through space-time is called its world line. Now, if I were to shoot a beam of light through the origin, what do you think the angle um, light would make um, with the graph? 45. 45? Uh, 45? 
Yes. Exactly. Six six months. Months. Uh, and if I were to shoot it in the opposite direction, so I shoot it this way the first time and that way the other time, what would it look like? Like that. Now you'll see that it does it it um it cuts up the Minkowski diagram into different segments. Now we now we can define these sections as the past, the present, and the future. Um, where do you think the past is? Relative. The past relative, relative, is relative, relative to the origin. We, you, you always have to define these things in terms of kind of which observer you're talking about. Here is the origin. So where do you think the past Third is? Quadrant. Third quadrant. Third quadrant. Huh? Third quadrant. Third quadrant. Bottom left. <laughs> this, this quadrant? Yeah. Not quite. Almost. Between <laughs> remember, light can go light, light can go this way, but light can also go this way. So between the bottom and the next bottom. Right. I think Stephanie got it. He was, she was drawing the this. Oh. Exactly. Oh. So that's the past. The thing about the past is the past is the region of the graph in which an event that happens in the past can affect you right now. You can see that because information, this will become really important, information travels at the speed of speed. That's the fastest information can travel. Light travels at speed, and so does information. Information will not travel fast. Now, using that same logic, what do you think the future is? Top curve. The top V. Yep. Right. This is the region. If an event is happening in the future, this is the region in which you can affect events here. You can, if, if I could, an event that happens in the future, I could make this happen. I could, I could, if I throw a baseball at a tree and a tree explodes in this future event, that's because I made it happen by throwing it. Be proud. I'm pretty strong, though I didn't win the carnival game yesterday. Where's the, now where's the last sector, the present? Pretty, everything. Yeah, everything else. Now this is a this is a strangest definition of present, right? I mean, because you think of present as now, nah, immediacy, like right? it would be that um, the x-axis, like things on the x-axis. That would be that's what that's what you think of as present. But here we're thinking of present as events that you can affect and they also can affect you. And this makes sense because you look at it, information cannot fast, uh, travel faster than sea. So things that happen in the present, the fastest thing you can do is shoot a light for you. Right? But things that happen in the present, they are so far away from you that there's just not enough time in order for like in order to, for, for um, they, them to affect each other. And these regions, the, the past, the future, and the present, kind of make explain cause that comes out. Here. You can see if we were, if we were, if we used an X and C T graph because it makes light a 45 degree. It, that, was, that was a very conscious choice. But in real life, we tend to think of things as like x and t, a meter versus a second. And this makes light seem almost instantaneous. Because if you would imagine an x and t graph, light would be almost horizontal to the x. It covers so much more space than it does time. So that's why like the original graph that I showed you. The light is not in It moves at sea. So the, these two, although they look deceptively similar, completely different conception of causality, right? When you bend these, when, when you change this corner to T, it becomes almost horizontal. This little patch that's under, you know, what we call present, which is no longer just the x-axis, but encloses some area more than the um, x-axis, will become important in the next which is what we call the loss of chronological order. So usually when you think about chronological order, you think that something happens with one other. So say, now I'm talking. Now I'm standing at the table. So this thing happened right after I um, stopped talking, right? So do you think it's possible that in a different frame, these two events could have happened in a different way? Not really. Oh. Not in this case. Because, the, because two, the two things I'm talking about are causally connected. But because I'm actually literally going from here to here to make this event happen. But if two events are not causally connected, meaning one event doesn't cause the other, then these two events can have some strange chronological order, where in some, from some person's perspective, event A happened before B. From the other person's 
perspective, B happened to <coughs> so how, can, how is this possible? So to see why this is possible, let's first look at a case where two events happen simultaneously from some person's per perspective, but not simultaneously from some other person's perspective. So in order to do this, we have to invoke something you derived in the exercise, the closing speed idea. So let's first look at a train. So this is a very, 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 very rough schematic drawing of the train, where you have the two ends of the train and some strange photon emitter in the middle. Photon emitter basically shoots light in all kinds of random directions. Now we only care about the horizontal direction. So notice that the photon director, not from, the photon emitter is equidistant from the two ends of the train. So if I shoot a photon from the middle, one to the left, one to the right, they're going to arrive at the end of the train simultaneously if I'm sitting in the train observing them. Is that clear? But what happens? What happens if, you know, a train is usually moving, not Amtrak sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> a train is moving with speed v relative to somebody standing on the ground. Then what happens? What happens to the closing speed between the left end of the train and the photon or, or and the light that's approaching? Huh? The left one is faster. Or it looks faster. Right. The closing speed is faster. Right? Because we said in a fundamental postulate, if I am actually um, observing the scenario from my perspective, which is stationary on the ground, light will be traveled to the left with speed c, and the train will be traveling to the right at speed v. So the closing speed between them the rate at which their separation decreases is actually C plus V. Whereas the closing speed between the right, the photon traveling toward the right will be C minus V. Because the train will be traveling to the right at speed V, and the light will be traveling at speed C. Which means, you know, it's going to take more time for the light to arrive at the um, wall on the right. What does this mean? This means that the two events, right, the leftward photon hits the left wall, the right photon hits the right wall, they happen simultaneously in the a person, as observed by a person sitting in the train. But to me, the left photon hit the wall first. Is that strange? Well, it really isn't strange when you think about it in the context of relativity. As we talked about, we have a much bigger region of space-time that we call the present. So, no matter what, things can be happen before me, after me, but they must be in the present if we are if they're not causally connected. So although we see that these two lights reach the two walls at different times relative to me, they're still both in the present. Or in other words, they're not causally connected. One cannot affect the other. So that's a key thing to take um, to think about, that causality is still preserved. Things that cause each other cannot just randomly reverse orders, but things can have strange chronological order because of the, you know, the chain, the, the fact that our special relativity changes the space-time structure. So now we're going to um, the part of the talk that some of you guys probably have seen in many documentaries slash TV shows by Michio Kaku. Um, so the first thing we're going to mention is called time dilation. So how many people have heard about time dilation? Excellent. Almost the entire room. So what is time dilation? Time dilation is the effect that time slows down when I measure it from a movie reference. How do we see this? Again, we will use a train that's moving at a very fast speed. Because in real life, this doesn't actually happen. If you want a train to move at that kind of speed, it would just travel out, out, out of our Earth. That would be hard to pull it back. <laughs> but think about a train traveling at speed B. So in the train's frame, we have two mirrors set up in this room. And a photon is emitted at the bottom of the mirror, shoots up, and then shoots down. This is basically the light clock that we talked about earlier. We use this light clock to measure units of time. But how about when the train is moving, we look at it from a stationary observer. When a beam of light would actually go on the hypotenuse, right, on the S, and then bounce down 
because the train, the top of the train has moved after it's emitted from the bottom. But remember, how fast does the light travel? It's C. It's C and it's always C. It's, doesn't, it's, it's not going to change just because I moved to a different reference frame. But we also know that the distance traveled by the train is V times T. T is a time elapsed. Which means the vertical speed of light actually slows down. Does that make sense? That's where Pythagorean theorem comes in. It's a very yeah, important theorem. Yeah, right. Because, as you can see on the right hand side, S squared equals H squared plus D squared. <laughs> and now we make some substitutions, we do some algebra, and physicists usually don't care to do them. And eventually we get some answer, which says T equals T prime divided by some factor. So now the question is, how big is that factor? What is T prime? Oh, I'm sorry. OK, maybe I should actually go through this. <laughs> See, physicists have bad habits. <laughs> so you notice from the Pythagoras uh, equation, we can plug in some quantities. So S is the distance that light travels. And we know that light travels at speed C. So after time T, light has traveled C times T. H is the quantity we're trying to find. And D equals V times T is a given because the trend is traveling at speed B. So we can express H as a function of T and the velocities. But now what we really want to do is to compare the time measured by an observer sitting inside the train versus the time measured by us. So to an observer sitting inside the train, the time it takes for the light beam to go up and down is what? Or not just go up, just go up. To go all the way up to the top of the mirror, how much time would it take for the observer sitting right in the train? It would be T. But it would also um, be H over C. Right? T is actually, t no, sorry, it wouldn't be T, because T is measured from our frame. So you have to keep thinking about which frame they're doing this from. So if you think about the time measured in the frame by, by an observer that's sitting inside the train, then it's just going to be the separation between the two mirrors divided by the speed of light. Because to them, the speed of the light is just traveling upward as can see. So what is the time measured by their frame? H over C? H over C, right? And this is exactly what we have here, right? The second to last line, we have H over C on the left, and that's what's measured by an observer that's sitting in the train. So now we go to the last line, we'll have T equals T prime divided by the square root of 1 minus V squared over C. So if we look at this equation, suppose T prime is just some number that we measure. And is T bigger than or smaller than T? In other words, is the denominator of this equation bigger than or smaller than 1? Smaller than 1. Why is it smaller than 1? OK. And B has to be less than C. OK, you guys are very good at math. So it's by no means obvious. But if the bottom part is smaller than 1, that means T is going to be bigger than T prime. If T is bigger than T prime, what does it say? It says that. If some process happens inside the train, or if the light beam it takes time t prime, will actually take a longer time for the light beam to go up in our frame. That's what's called time dilation. The word dilate comes from the fact that it takes more time. So now look at your problem sheet again. Look at problem two. So problem two asks you to think about how do you go from this simple thought experiment to something much more general? which is that any time, not just the time it takes for light to go from the bottom to the top of but any kind of time measure, any kind of physical process will appear to slow down when I observe it from the moving 